welcome uh, to our charter conversation around education innovation. Uh, we're really excited to jump in with our uh, three esteemed panelists today. Um, I'm always really excited to talk about this topic. Uh, it's, it's one of my favorites, and I, I really think it's the best category because I think this is what charter schools are really all about, um, is the innovation. Um, so I would like for you first to introduce yourself uh, to our audience, um, tell them your name, and tell them a little bit about your school. Amy, do you want to kick it off? Sure, thanks. My name is Amy Bottomley, and I'm the executive director of the Micro Society Academy Charter School. It's located in Nashua, New Hampshire. And we're a kindergarten through eighth grade school. And our concept is about real world application. Our students are taking what they're learning in the classroom and applying it through the operation of their own miniature society. So all of our students have jobs, they earn paychecks, and they get days off to spend it. But they're really truly learning the ins and outs of their communities and what life might look like in the real world. Um, hi, I'm Peter Wazorek. I'm the director and one of the teachers at Northwest Passage High School in Coon Rapids, Minnesota. Uh, we serve students from 14 to 21, um, and our focus is on uh, student-centered, project-based learning and experiential learning. Uh, we take students on 20 to 25 overnight learning expeditions every year at no cost to students and families. Hi, I'm Buffy Cushman Pates. I'm the executive director and founder of SEEKS, the school for examining essential questions of sustainability in Honolulu, Hawaii. Our basic model is this, com this combination of uh, intentional community building that we think of as the soil, explicit content courses, math, science, English, social studies that we think of as the seeds that get planted in that soil, and then interdisciplinary project-based learning around examining essential questions of sustainability, that is the watering of the seeds in that soil. Terrific. So we have three very unique models and three very unique places, uh, but we're really excited to kind of dig in with all y'all. Um, want to start though with uh, education innovation and what it means, because if you ask 10 different people, it may mean 10 different things to them. So what does education innovation mean to you, and how does that show up in your school or your school model? Uh, Amy, do you want to start us off? Yeah, so I think educational innovation to me is a different approach to education. As we know, education really isn't one size fits all. And so to have schools out there, such as myself and my colleagues, to have a different approach that might better hit home for a student in their learning, that truly for me is what educational innovation is. And, you know, at our school, our motto is relate, connect, and understand. And so when we're talking about that, we're talking about relating what we're learning in the classroom and connecting it to the real world so they have a better understanding of why they need an education for life. You know, we've been doing uh, high school education for the same way for over 100 years. Um, we really base it off of an industrial model where um, we have bell schedules and students switch classes um, every hour and they um, are in content siloed uh, classes that don't connect. Um, and so for us, innovation is really about let's first of all reduce the size because the large institutional schools we know don't work for all students. And so let's reduce the size, let's humanize the high school experience, let's build upon it with relationships um, where students and staff get to know each other. Um, at Northwest Passage, we go by first names, and that's really important for us to make that connection. Um, and then let's take a look at where students are, what their needs are, and what is their learning, what do they want to get out of it. And so that's where that student-centered learning, uh, project-based learning happens, is that with a small school and small class sizes advisory model, we can really focus on each individual student, help them develop a personal learning plan through high school, um, and really address uh, each student's needs, and then Again, because we're small, we can be adaptable and adept at what we're doing. Um, we can get students out of the classroom learning by doing. Uh, that's one of our hallmarks for our school is um, at any given point, a quarter to a third of the students are out learning by doing um, in everything from a day long field study, doing you know biological research or a service project, all the way to seven to 10 day overnight learning experiences. To some degree, we're not really innovating. We're just saying, 
this thing that is happening in most schools doesn't work for kids. And it's not based on how people learn. We know so much about how people learn these days and most schools aren't designed around that. And I think one of the advantages that we have as charter schools is to start fresh, right? That that's like, when you start a, a charter school, you get to say, uh, no, not that, not that, not that, this. This is, this is what works, this is what, and, 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 you know, Peter said it in his talk, I said in mine too, like we created the schools we wanted to go to, right? And I think what really is important to acknowledge is that, you know, sometimes people talk about school and this industrial model as, as preparation for life beyond school, but like kids are living their lives right now and they deserve to have every day of their lives be meaningful and important, not preparation for something else, but the thing that they're living right now that matters and so I think education innovation is acknowledging kids as whole human beings and creating educational environments that, that cater to them and how they learn and what they need. And we all know that at this point in the world, that's not just about learning content. It's social emotional learning, it's experiential learning, it's so many different things. Yeah, I love that. So with that backdrop then at Seeks, what does that look like? How you spend your time is how you enact your values. I value as a human being, I value opportunity to connect with other people and I also value physical activity. I value learning for the sake of learning. Like I, I really love math and I always have and I think that's valuable and I love to read and I want students to learn to love to read, right? So there's time built in for that. And then I also value getting out, getting dirty, doing things that matter and, and take those skills and tools you learned and application of those. So there's time built in for that as well. There's lots more I could say, but you know, I don't want to yeah, I want to make sure I share the air. <laughs> no, that's a great start. Yeah. Um, so, Amy, I, I want to start with you and dive in a little bit more into what you do at Micro Society. And I think one of the fascinating things is that the, the things that you're talking about, it starts at kindergarten. So could you kind of walk us through an example or maybe a progression of learning that your students do starting at kindergarten and how that kind of scaffolds up as they get older? Yeah, absolutely. So... Um, our program actually is a slow rollout. Like we, we say we open our society up for business, but it doesn't really happen until about December because we're doing mini lessons with the students. So they're developmentally appropriate where we're teaching them about certain types of government. You know, you know, is there a monarchy? You know, what's a monarchy? What's a dictatorship? You know, like things like that. So we're doing all these different rollouts. So they're understanding a little more about societal issues and things they might be facing when they get open for their own jobs and what have you. But um, so for kindergarten, we start small. It's picture based. So if you're writing a resume, you know, they're, they're not fully writing. So we do picture based election cards for them, things like that. And we will we'll progress up through the grades. Kindergarten, they have um, their first jobs are in their classroom. So we're still having them go through an interview process but they're simple questions and they're applying for jobs within their own classroom community, but they still get a day off, but they can be a little rambunctious. So we have what we call taxi drivers. So the taxi drivers come around and pick up the students on their day off and take them around to the various, you know, businesses and agencies. And then we have um, our police force or our peacekeepers that are monitoring hallways and they're reminding the kindergartners that, you know, we walk in the halls and you walk to the left and you see all these different things and they find them if they're a little rambunctious. And, you know, that's a, a life lesson. You're writing in the halls and you get a fine and now you don't have that money to go spend on your day off. So they're learning all that. So they're, they're learning the fiscal responsibility. So when they get to those older grades, they now know what the expectation is to be an employee. So when they're now going out and applying for a job in a different cla like community classroom. And for our program, it is, with the exception of um, kindergarten, it's mixed through eighth grade. So our eighth graders, our seventh or sixth, are our leaders. As early as fourth grade, however, you can apply to be a business owner. And so you have to fill out a business plan. And you have to, if you get picked, you have to get a, a a bank loan and hire all your employees. So that's how we scaffold up. You know, it gets a lot more intense and complicated in the expectations of what students do. Cool. That sounds great. 
So for the little ones, when they blow all their money, do, what do they do on their day off? They just sit, yeah, so sit around looking at the wall? there's two issues they have. They blow their money and then they're... No, there's been tears. There, there oh, has sure. been tears, but it's a teachable moment. It's our safe place to make mistakes and learn. They're learning opportunities. The other thing they, they don't have enough money for often is taxes. So our students pay taxes. And so there are, you'll see them walking around the halls going, I have to pay my taxes. Does anyone have money to get in? They're not allowed to share money. But these are the societal problems that come up, and students are now solving the issues on their own. So they're proposing bills that are debated, like I said in my talk in congressional session, and if they're passed into law, then it's a law, and that's how they're solving problems that come up year to year in their society. So it's pretty neat. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So, Peter... Your school has been around a lot longer than my school, than the school, other schools up here. How do you continue to innovate when you've been around for 20 plus years? It, it really is about continual improvement. Um, I am blessed to work with a team of people who are not content with um, just sort of resting. Um, and we're always um, challenging each other to say, how can we do this better? What can we address that's not been addressed? Um, how do we listen to students and families um, and see what their needs are? Um, you know, over that time, um, things have evolved um, in uh, many different ways. Um, I talked about our ninth grade um, Headwaters program. Um, we, as a standalone high school, um, didn't have as many true ninth graders coming in, and we knew that there was um, an opportunity there. Um, and we also knew that the ninth graders that we had, um, like so many other ninth graders around the country, were kind of struggling with that transition into high school. Um, and so I had come across an article about ninth grade shock and the sort of the national talk around students uh, failing their classes for the first time, falling behind, being able to be tracked into not graduating on time already in ninth grade, um, and the stress level that all of the new expectations were, were coming. Um, and so uh, I brought that to the team and said, I think this is something real. And like, even though we have many of the things that they talk about to, to help mitigate some of that shock, we still could do more. And um, so I brought it to the team and said, I think this is something we should really investigate. Um, and a couple of people, uh, staff jumped on it and said, yes, I've, I'm thinking the same thing. I want to do more. Um, and that had about a year long process of kind of doing the research and looking uh, at options and like, what were we already doing? What could we do better? Um, and then we rolled that out um, five years ago. Um, to great success, other than the fact that our very first cohort ended in March when the pandemic hit, um, and they went a <laughs> distance. Um, and then the next group was almost exclusively hybrid. Um, but we're now um, into that fifth class of ninth graders. And what we're seeing is um, uh, more credits earned on track for graduation, being involved in many, many more things, including expeditions and clubs, um, and just becoming leaders um, in the school. And it's it's actually sort of transformed some things um, that we hadn't anticipated um, for a long time. Um, most of our students were coming into us as 10th, 11th, 12th graders um, behind the credit, unhappy with their current school situation. And now that's being transformed. And so I think when you think about like, what are we doing? It's constantly asking the questions, what can we do better? And, and sharing them with others. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. And it, it's clear that for you, the innovation is really about staying in touch with your community, the needs of your students. And that is, there's always something there, right? There's always ways that you can improve. Um, so Buffy, I know that middle schoolers have a special place in your heart, right? Definitely. Given the students you serve. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I, I have middle schoolers myself. And okay. I know that sometimes, you know, their minds are pretty far from important issues of the day. So how do your middle schoolers at SEEKS take to the idea that they actually need to have an impact on sustainability, which is obviously a very heavy thing? Um, a couple of ways. One is because we don't tell them we, they need to. They, we show them, right? And they, they have experiences day after day where their voices are valued and, and not in some like 
formal way, in, in, in tons of informal ways, from the morning meeting that we talk about where every day, every single day, every student in our school is greeted by name, by someone in their advisory, and every single day, everyone contributes to a sharing prompt. So just like in the first 10 minutes of the day, my voice matters, people care what I think, right? So that, that's why that community is the foundation soil. It's one of the things I learned in our very first year of the school is that you can't get kids to think about global issues of sustainability, because, you know, let, let's say sustainability is really understanding that our actions have impact on others, right? But sustainability, we usually think on that globally, right? Students in middle school first need to understand that their actions have impact on others right around them, you know? And so that's why we've built such a heavy focus on community and understanding that at the local, micro-local scale, that then can be scaled up. But I'd say beyond that, it's also that we just are doing, the kids are doing things every day that matter. And then at the end of the semester, they have project exhibitions. Those project exhibitions, they're not for a grade. They're not for anything other than celebration of you're the expert in this. And honestly, we had project exhibitions in our design from the very beginning. And the first one we did, we did it off campus at this cafe. And we were like, we're crazy for doing this. We took you know, 50 students there and they were off the walls giddy with just like, oh my gosh, I'm the expert in this. I'm the expert in this. All these people came and listened to me and you could just see their worlds transform. And it, exhibitions are a lot of work, but we will never not do them. And we even did them during the pandemic. We did them virtually. Like exhibitions just give students that true knowledge that what they know matters. What they know and what they're able to do and what they have done matters. And so we're not telling them, they're experiencing it. I think that's the fundamental philosophy of our school is that like, you know, no, no kid is ever saying, why do I need to know this? Because they know they, why they need to know it because they had to use it. I'm interested what you say to people that talk, you know, they're like, it's all about literacy and math. How does what you're doing tie into core curriculum? Because I'm sure that's something you hear all the time. Well, we would do this, but we need to spend our time focused on these other things. So one of my favorite times a year at our school is when our business owners present the annual report. Mm -hmm. And in their annual report, they actually tie in the academic standards they've been working on. So they have to identify that, you know, and then they're also in their report, they'll cover things like their um, profit and loss statements, customer reviews and things like that. But there's a true academic tie in that is so evident when those students are presenting. And um, there's always cross connections being made. So when they're in the classroom, our teachers are um, giving examples of how, you know, when we're le learning about um, algebra, how that might apply to like a retail store situation. So like they're giving these examples in real time in the classroom. So that's when we talk about those aha moment, moments. It, it can happen in both the job. It can happen in both the, in the classroom setting as well. So, Buffy, I want to talk a little bit with you um, around sort of your model and it's and how it works within your environment. You know, obviously, you you leverage the issues that are first and foremost at the you know right in front of your students, like whether it's the invasive species that are you know taking over some of the areas in Hawaii. And so, your model really does kind of apply the principles to that. What would you say if somebody came to you and said, I, would, I love what you're doing, I want to do it somewhere else. How could they take what you're doing and, and use that in somewhere that doesn't have the same issues that you face in Hawaii? Yeah, I think it's actually really transferable. Um, I mean, let me not overstate that. But I think that, that fundamentally, you know, examining essential questions of sustainability, we determine what those essential questions of sustainability are every year, actually right around this time for next year. And we pick the topics. But, you know, if, if we were in, I, I better pick Florida because I know something about Florida. If we were in Florida, we might be talking about, you know, sea level rise or um, buildings falling down or, you know, invasive species. Like there's invasive species everywhere, right? There's, there's all different kinds of issues of sustainability. Everybody needs to think about energy. You know, so it's, it's just really evaluating in your place what are the 
the questions that need examining, and, and some of them are transferable. And some, you know, one of our essential questions of right now is about responsible tourism. Florida would also need to examine that, and different places have different things. Overall, though, our school model that it's our, our school model isn't just about sustainability. Our school model is about honoring students and and giving creating their their days that really value how their that their time is valuable, acknowledging that their time is value. I said when I first created SEEKS, we could have created the school for examining essential questions of humanities or the school for examining essential questions of law, you know, examining essential questions of whatever deep dive topic, because more than anything, it's just the time is carved out in the day for that interdisciplinary project-based work to think deeply and look at it from multiple different lenses. And so that's what I think makes it transferable is that it's really more than anything, it's about how time is spent. We've talked a lot about innovations that you have done, right? Things that you have put in place, uh, but we're a safe space here. So what, what are some, uh, maybe a problem, it could be one or two problems that you face right now that you're probably gonna have to come up with something to solve for it. Uh, you might not have the idea, but I think, you know, oftentimes you come up on these panels and, and we have to act as if we got it all figured out. I know I don't get it all figured out. There's lots of things that we're trying to work through. So are there any problems like that you guys are, are working through that you'd be willing to kind of share and maybe some of the ideas that you have initially, but maybe, maybe you haven't solved it all. That's okay. Sometimes you can imagine being in a, a kindergarten through eighth grade school. It is hard to mix those grade levels. And especially in this 21st century society we're living in, um, interests have really evolved, especially around business and electronics and things like that. So the older kids are not interested in the same business ideas as the younger kids. Like the younger kids in our school are like crafts, right? Let's make bracelets and all these older kids want more of a challenge. So we have really struggled with what are we are going to do to change things up for our middle schoolers so they're feeling more of a challenge. So what we're um, pitching to do and talking, and of course we're involving the kids in this conversation, which is pretty amazing and what we want. We want their input as stakeholders, but we're thinking of going to elective-based courses that are micro, what we would call micro-themes. So they would take for instance, financial 101, and it would be more of a life skills, business-based finance class. Um, it could be civic engagement, and they're getting out in their community, and they're doing what we like to call heart goals. We have heart goals in our school where they're doing community service-based projects. So we're looking at, um, in discussions right now, looking at doing that. So then the students are also getting a decision on what they're choosing, their interest area, um, so they can take that elective class. We would still have things like a government and all, you know, president and all that in place, but that's something we've been kicking around. And we are in the middle of an expansion right now. And um, in about a year's time, we'll have two buildings on our campus. So we will be able to split our younger and upper. So we're, we're considering having those students that really want to come and mentor the, littles, the little children in their businesses to be able to do that not take that away from them, but then also have this opportunity where students could do elective micro-themed classes. One of the thoughts that uh, we've been um, talking about for a while now is, um, you know, when we came out of the pandemic, um, we had been in a world of online and hybrid learning. Um, and some of our students did really well with that. Um, and um, we're looking at how do we add another layer in um, that is maybe that hybrid learning model where um, we're able to give students a bit more freedom. Um, we do a lot of, like I said, out of the classroom kind of things. Um, and so how do we create a model that honors that, um, but also connects and stays with the the uh, core for us of building relationships, of doing expeditions and having experiences. Um, we can't do that in front of screens. And so how do we sort of balance those two things um, and create a, um, a flexible learning schedule uh, where students have an advisor, they have advisory meetings, maybe they're, um, some of them are online, maybe some of them are in school, maybe some of them are meetups. Um, where we still can do uh, expeditions, we can still do project-based learning. Um, and so that's one of the ones that we've been really thinking a lot about 
um, is again, addressing the needs of our students who are saying, I really don't want to be at school every day all the time. And isn't that also what a lot of career and work world is developing into too? And how do we help prepare them for that um, without losing all of our core beliefs and, and the essential pieces of, of our school? Excellent. Um, so speaking of operational areas, uh, Peter, I have a question for you that, you know, I'm sure a lot of people are thinking about because you talked to, you talk about the fact that you bring your students on all of these experiences and trips. It's at no cost to them. How? <laughs> <laughs> the first few years of um, Northwest Passage, um, we offered a couple of opportunities, um, but there were more of that sort of travel club model where Families were paying for the the whole trip, um, but a lot of us came together to um, design Northwest Passage, having had experiences outside of traditional education. And a lot of us were had worked at um, camps and youth serving agencies and done trip and travel programs. And we knew the power of uh, experiential learning. And we said we want to really be able to do more of this. And we can connect this to standards and learning targets and we can award credit for that. But if students and families have to pay for it, then there's this, this interaction there that's not equitable. Uh, you know, they're basically paying for credits. If you can afford to do it, then you can get these extra credits. Um, and our board uh, decided that we wanted to fully fund them. And we um, set a, um, a goal every year uh, that we would use out of our general operating budget um, that would cover that. We're a small school, so we don't have sports and band and things like that, that, you know, if you look at a line item of a big district, how much they spend, and that is incredible. Um, and so as a percentage, it's still not nearly what those things are. And um, with those 20 to 25 trips, we can offer enough spaces for every student to take at least one trip a year. Not every student always does for a lot of reasons, but we have enough spaces that everyone can participate in that. And so it really is, you know, Buffy, you talked about like deciding what your values are and what your mission is drives what you do. And that is part of our mission, exploring our world. Um, and so um, we've gotten better and better every year that we do it on looking at how do we spend that money? We don't go through expensive travel companies. Um, we just got back from a, a trip to Washington, D.C., and we take a small group, a van load, or some, sometimes two, but usually one van, two staff. And we don't do, we're not that group with a hundred and some kids with a leader with a flag and everyone with their headpieces and doing that. Um, our students are actually designing the trip. And so before they leave, they have to pick two areas um, in DC that they're really interested in visiting and learning. They become the experts and then they um, share with the rest of the group. And so it's very um, cost effective. It's intimate that way. Um, we found Airbnbs are really a, a reasonable way of traveling with small groups. Um, we built connections over the years where folks will give us um, discounts and breaks on things, you know, so it is, it's time consuming and it is, um, it is definitely an addi additional level for our teaching staff. Um, but I've been all around the world in 25 or 20 years, you know, with, um, with students. So it's definitely worth it. No, that's amazing. And I think, you know, Buffy, you, you had talked about how you spend your time reflects your values, but I think also how you spend your money totally. reflects your Definitely. values too. Yeah. And so, Peter, clearly you've made this commitment to this area, and I think your students have really benefited from it. So that's great. So I, I just really appreciate you all being here today on this panel, sharing your experiences. You all are doing amazing work at your schools, serving your, your students, your communities. So I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to spend some time with you all today. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.